Loud enough, guys, or does it need to be louder? Okay. Hey, guys, is this loud enough? I don't think it is. We'll just all move closer. <laughs> Is that any better? I don't know. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Well, she refused and then last week she had her retina appointment and they said you will be in the family's office today. So they sent her to the hospital. That's right. I guess everything was okay. My therapist, when you look at someone like that, they have a line there. And it can take uh -huh. three to four weeks to develop into confusion and all that kind of stuff. So it's important for her to. Katie, we good? Yep. Okay. Hey, good morning, everybody. Beautiful morning. So you can sort of understand me. Anyway, uh, we do have a bunch of, uh, I'll just welcome you here this morning. Beautiful morning. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, welcome you here this morning. Glad to see you all. We do have uh, some announcements this morning. If you were here last week for the offering fiasco, uh, <laughs> We've changed containers. Uh, there's a uh, like a coffee can up there with a slit in it uh, where your uh, offering would go. Uh, it went to the four winds last week. Uh, so the wind's not near as bad this week, so it would be all right. Um, also, too, um, just a couple of announcements. This Wednesday's Bible study at 6 o'clock, followed by a PPR meeting. Uh, Monday at 6 o'clock over at Margaret's is the Prayer Shaw Ministry Meeting. Tuesday, I'm thinking at 6 o'clock also, is the Women's Fellowship uh, Meeting. And uh, Saturday, gentlemen and young men and anybody 
uh, that would like to. Uh, we are going to have uh, uh, start back up our men's fellowship and Saturday the 29th at 3 p.m. Uh, we're going to have a get together. That fireplace that you see down there, uh, we're going to fix that up and dedicate it and so that we can have fellowship and that kind of stuff down there. Um, if you see, I have a, a target down there. Um, so if you guys, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I'm an archer. You know that I have a, I have a recurve down there, and we'll recurve target bow. Um, and maybe for the younger ones, we could have something like that, or you know, just think about that. If you have a target or something like that, or something you'd like to bring and show. And we're going to slide, we're going to cook some hot dogs, and I don't know what all else. And when you're not looking, we're going to slide Jesus in there. So, all right. Um, we have two dates this month, the 23rd and the 30th, that we're going to take in new members and have baptism, you know, that we didn't get done on Palm Sunday. And it seems like forever ago that I talked to some of you about being mentors, I will recontact you this week. And so uh, keep that in prayer. Um, is there any other announcements that I need to make? Oh, yeah, I do. Here. I forgot. Up there, there is, um, Katie has a, a bunch of these things. T-shirts. Yeah. Well, she don't have, I don't think she has T-shirts up there. Yeah, there's a couple shirts up there if anybody wants to see what they actually look like, but there's order forms up on the table, and then we're, it's just going to be a rolling fundraiser to raise money for the camp fund, and I'll also have an order form online later on on our website. Yeah, and I know personally they come in extra fat, so uh, <laughs> you know, uh, help the camping program and um, get yourself a great t-shirt with different things on it. Uh, thank Katie. I personally want to thank everybody who had something to do with last night, uh, with the, the BBS that we had for the one night. Uh, there was there's folks uh, that worked so hard, Katie, Whitney, uh, Jamie, uh, Mike, and Junior. Uh, they built a screen out here, uh, got everything ready. We had a movie. The kids had a great time. Uh, Jim uh, Doika is a professional hot dog cooker, <laughs> and uh, he knows exactly how many to put on the grill and how many not, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and there was snacks. It was such a great time. It was such a peaceful night. There was fireflies out. Uh, we had Christmas in July and showed the movie star. And you know, and I and it was mentioned by several last night. Uh, since we have this stuff now that we can do outdoor movies, uh, we can resume maybe our movie night even if we can't go inside. And uh, so that's that's in the planning process. Any other announcements this morning? If there is none, Karen, would you bring us into worship? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. I have for our call to worship this morning. 
just one verse. It comes out of the third chapter of Ruth, the first verse. Now this is why this is so important for us today. The, the, the book of Ruth has three main characters. There's Ruth herself. There is Naomi, her mother-in-law. And there is Boaz, who was her kinsman redeemer. Before anything could happen, there was a prayer intervention by Naomi to her daughter-in-law, Ruth, whom she never calls her daughter-in-law. She says, my daughter. Everybody understand that? But there was a prayer intervention by this woman that changed everything. And I'd like to read that to you this morning. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, I shall not seek rest for thee, that it may be well for thee. She prayed through, I know that's old language, for someone she loved so that God's will would be done. I hope you're doing that for somebody you love today. Amen? So, once again, God is good. All the time. And if you can, and if you would, would you stand? Does everybody have a song sheet this morning? Uh, we're going to have a praise chorus. It is, uh, I keep falling in love with him. How many of you know that, that, that praise chorus? Good, 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 good. We're going to go straight from that. After you've done that, we're going to have a welcome time, and we're going to go straight into um, what a friend we have in Jesus, huh? Okay, Karen, let's let's get her going there. I keep falling in love. sing it again and you're not going to listen to me because here's what happens this I hear back here on the piano and then by the time it gets transferred out here to the speakers up ahead there's a time differential <laughs> and it's only just a little bit so if we're not yeah you know so if we're not just sing it and just wing it okay uh, keep it on. some of these great old hymns that we need to know the theology of. At one point in time, if I was going to have a service up at the cemetery up here, uh, this hymn that we're about to sing would be the one that would be sang, sung. But you know what? I can't do it anymore. You know why? Solo. <laughs> yeah, because nobody knows the song anymore. And the only song that I can sing that everybody knows without a paper in front of them is Amazing Grace. 
This is a great song that's been sung for centuries, and especially at times when a loved one has passed. You need that intervention of Jesus in your life. What a prayer. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we just thank you this morning that we have a friend in Jesus. That we can take all of our problems, our griefs, everything to you at any time because you're a God that does not sleep, nor does he slumber. And Father, today as we come together as the church and we break together once again the bread of life from your word may these words and these actions be so consecrated in the holy spirit that there would be an outpouring of your spirit upon us all today so it's in the christ's name that we pray amen thank you, you may be seated Okay, praises in, uh, uh, no, let me, let me do a responsive reading first. Psalms 12. Psalms chapter 12. Uh, the whole, the whole psalm. There is only, uh, let me get this mic out of here. There's only eight verses in Psalms 12, and it's, it's, it's a very good psalm for today. Listen to these words of the Psalm of David. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful fall among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, even flattering lips and a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who has said, with our tongue we shall prevail, our lips our own? Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighting of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked shall walk on every side 
while the vilest are exalted. And the people said. So a time of uh, praise and prayer. Uh, I already said thank you for everybody that had everything to, anything to do with last night. But boy, it was a praise. We had, we had a good bunch of folks out. The kids were out. Uh, it was good. It was really, really good. Thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for anybody that went that extra mile to, in these difficult times that uh, ministry would go for us. And I really do appreciate that. Uh, I think I saw Vince back there. Uh, Vince, glad to see you. I know that you're going through a very rough time. I admire your faithfulness, Vince. I, I see a man in you that I didn't know five years ago. And how God has transformed you into a man of God. And I, you, you know, listen, he's going through a really hard time. And, and we should be in prayer for his mother, for his wife, because, but a lot of this falls on the spouse, and he's the one that needs to be strong. And I just hope you just keep your prayers up for the whole family, huh? Uh, what are the praises we got today? Tell me something good. Hi, Vince. I, I would like to thank everybody on behalf of Marjorie and I for support that we have gotten throughout it so far. It's been, it's been really nice. It's been overwhelming. I appreciate that from all those that reached out. Okay. Susie, I saw you. Our baby girl turned 16 this week. Wow. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. Somebody else this morning got a praise. I don't have glasses on. I think that's Sandy that raised her hand. Yeah. I got to spend some time with my baby brothers, my uh, younger brother that had his own oxygen, my baby brother that just had the heart, um, the defibrillator pacemaker. I spent it on my baby brother's form. Got to play with the goats. Had a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful morning. Thank you, Sandy. Bill? Uh, Monday, we uh, got up to uh, see Terry's dad. And uh, we spent about two and a half hours with him. And then her sister and brother-in-law was there. And we went and had lunch together. And it was really, really a great day. Thank you. Somebody else? Shirley? Katie Lynn and her family are so, traveling mercies, they'll be going back either today or tomorrow. All right. How about prayers today? Who do we need to lift up? I want you to remember the Hoyer family. Uh, we prayed for Mrs. Hoyer last week, uh, and she passed. Uh, so, just pray for the family. And uh, it's always difficult. Uh, and, of course, keep uh, Irene and Sis in your prayers, Byron. Um, uh, we really need our prayers, but uh, keep keep praying, keep praying. Remember our covenant with Andrew and Jared um, and all the other service people. Who else? Anybody else this morning, Sherry? Rue. Uh, yeah, our, our niece Rue. Um, just not doing real well. I would really like to get down to see her. I'm a little concerned about crossing the state line and whether I have to go into court obtaining afterwards. Uh, but anyway, uh, I can see her in my heart, if nothing else. So, anybody else this morning go? Hi, Gert. Hi. I wanted to put Pat and Nikki on his birthday. They're going down to see Jesse tomorrow morning at 4 o'clock. I think they're leaving uh, to Kansas. And also Randy, if he's not going to say anything, to keep him in prayer. Okay. All right. Anybody else this morning? Uh, unspoken, just, just raise your hand. All right, let's go to the word of prayer. Father, once again, you've been so good, and um, 
this beautiful day that you've given us uh, and the opportunity to come together as your body in a very difficult time. And Father, uh, as, as gathered in front of me and gathered uh, watching on whatever they're watching or listening, whatever they're watch, listening to, uh, there are folks, a lot of folks with stuff going on in their life. And Father, we just, we just lift all those folks up. I thank you that, that we can praise you even when it, it's hard to praise. And I just thank you for that. Um, I thank you for everybody that made last night such a success. And I pray for the seed uh, that was sown in the lives of perhaps the kids or even the adults that were there last night. And I thank you for the ongoing ministry um, that happens. And Father, as we come close to um, the time when schools are opening up and uh, people have to make decisions on how to do that and what's the best way. And I just, just would lift uh, David up to you this morning, David Lehman as he is the superintendent out here at Forest Hills. And I know his heart. And I know he wants to do what's right. And there's so many variables. And so we're just praying this morning, Father, not for just the Forest Hills School District, but for all the schools and the colleges that are coming back and all the students and the teachers and, and, and uh, the workers in the schools and that it would be a safe place. And Father, for um, the ones that's been lifted up here today in prayer, uh, the names, um, Father, we just, we just, you know those needs, and you know what needs to be done in them, so we just lift them up to you this morning. Uh, for for our, our nation and our leaders, in a time where it seems that nobody can get along for all the unrest that's everywhere for the uh, for the terrible disaster over in Lebanon and now has that has turned into violence and there's violence all over the world and the economies are shrinking and Father we just need Jesus now more than ever for all the unspoken requests today. Uh, Father, we just hold them up to you for the direction of this church that we may hear that still small voice of, of God and take action upon it. And for the word today, uh, Father, that it might be saturated with the presence of the Holy Spirit so that none of us would leave here without feeling like we have been in God's presence. And so, Father, as we come to this time where we break the word together, may we do so with an attitude of prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. The title of my sermon this morning is The Jesus Fan Club. It comes out of the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter, the 57th uh, verse to the end of the chapter. Luke chapter 9, starting at 57 and going through the end of the chapter. Now before you stand today, I shared with the Sunday school this morning if you don't find a quiet place where God can speak to you, Jesus will 
take matters into his own hands and he will abuse you. These are tough words this morning. I just lost my place because why is it that every Sunday morning there is absolutely no wind till we get to uh, get to this point. But these are tough words this morning and not to be taken lightly. Uh, so I would invite you, if you could and if you would, to stand with me as we give reverence to the word this day. Luke chapter 9, verse 57 through 62. And it came to pass, as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithsoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but thou go and preach the kingdom of God. And also another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at my home, at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. The reading of the word for the people of the word. Let's pray. Father, as, as, as we come together this morning, I just ask, this is a difficult text. I just ask that you would rightly divide it. And that in your rebuke uh, to all of us, that we would take heed to the voice of God. And so, Father, as I'm praying for everybody that's here and everybody that's listening, I just pray that they're praying for this sinner. That the part of me who rebels against the word, like these men did, would be softened. That hard heart would be softened. And that you would allow your Holy Spirit to fill, fill the void where that heart once was. And so that nothing would be said today and especially in a text like this where it could be taken so far out of context that nobody would be hurt uh, by a wrong saying and that Satan could not play his trickery on us so that we would not listen to that voice of God. And so, Father, we thank you that we are blood-bought and Jesus paid. And we can proclaim the name of Jesus Christ in victory over all things. For it's in that Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. The Jesus Fan Club. Now, if you would have asked me just a week ago about that title, I would have had a complete and total different take on it, on what I have today. Uh, the Jesus Fan Club, you know, I, I, I just thought, boy, what a club that would be to be in, huh? I'd like to be a part of that club. Um, and that's true. I want to be a fan of Jesus Christ. And then Tuesday, uh, I was on my way out here, Tuesday morning, uh, to meet with Josh Plummer. And on the way out here, I was listening to Tony Evans. And Dr. Evans had a complete and total different take on this idea of a fan club. And here's what uh, Dr. Evans describes a fan. A fan is somebody who knows all about somebody. You know, if they're really dedicated, they can tell you the stats of that person. 
They can tell you the history of that person. They can tell you all about that person. They wear the shirts. They got the license plates on their cars. They got stickers. And if you're really, really dedicated, maybe they even got a tattoo on them that says something about it. They know all about that person, but a fan doesn't know the person. They know all about him, but they don't know him or her. <laughs> Dr. Evans says that what we got going on in churches today is Jesus' fan clubs. They wear the shirts. They have the license plates on their cars. They got a cross around their neck. They even go to his house for a visit every once in a while. And then they quote his words when it's convenient to quote his words. They know all about Jesus, but they just don't know him. Just prior to this, in verse 51 of that chapter, there's a turning point in the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel tells us that Jesus knows that it is his time has come. That his purpose that he came to earth for is finally here. And it is time. And Luke tells us that Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. And he didn't turn from the left nor did he turn from the right, but he kept his face toward Jerusalem, knowing all the while what was going to happen in Jerusalem. That in that city of David, he was going to go to a cross for you and for me and for everybody else in the world and pay the sin debt that only God could pay. And even knowing what was going to happen, he set his face toward the cross. And at this moment of decision in Jesus' life to do what the Father told him to do, he is confronted by two men and he confronts another in regards to following him. Each one of these men have a desire to follow him. But there are areas about following Jesus that are challenging to the, him, to them. One is the security of a home because Jesus' home is in heaven. Two is the preaching of the gospel. And if one commits to that preaching, one is commanded to have that preaching be precedence, precedence over everything else, even death. And third, family. I just want to tell you guys something, so I'm really up front with you. If you're serious about following Jesus Christ, it's going to strain your family life. If you're serious about following Jesus Christ, it's going to strain your family life. All three of these situations that these men came up with are very understandable, and I can relate to all three of them. And all three of them tugs at your heart. I believe Jesus wants us to know up front what the cost of being his disciple is going to be. So there's no question of when it happens. There is a difference from being a Jesus disciple and being a member of the Jesus fan club. I just have three things that I'd like to talk to you this morning about that God has really laid upon my heart this week. One is security. And then I have in my notes, in parentheses, false security. 
Some of you know and some of you don't know that Sherry and I live on the Grove Homestead. That's where that one over there came from. Um, nobody really knows how it got started. And there's so many different stories about how it got divided uh, that no one really knows. There's really not too much to it. There's a half an, eight, half an inch of topsoil and then there's rock. There's not one inch of level ground on it. There's all kind of creatures and critters that go bump in the night. Despite all that, to me it's home. Hmm. I find security in all of that. But I am here to tell you that it's a lie. There are very few people that know it's the Grow Homestead. And there's even fewer that know that it was the Roland Homestead before it was the Grow Homestead. And then there's even fewer than that to know that it was the Bishop Homestead before it was the Roland Homestead, even though they were all related in some way. And most of the people think of it as more hollow and not what it really is. And I will tell you something else. One day, someone else will own that little hunk of earth and they won't ever remember that it was the Moore homestead. Listen, we find security in earthly things. And that is not what Jesus taught. If you have, Jesus reminds us of the false security of this world. If you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, your real home today is not here or where you live. Your real home is heaven. That's as if you accepted him in your heart. If you have rejected him here today, sadly, your real home is in hell. No one is exempt from death. No one will escape judgment. And there is nothing in this world or the world to come that is secure except Jesus Christ. Nothing. My second point to you is death. Now, that, that's a dirty word. That's a word that, that none of us really like to talk about. The uniqueness of this man who asked Jesus if he could go bury his father is. The other two, Jesus asked Jesus if they could follow him. But this man, Jesus calls out. He said in that verse, follow me. It was Jesus that initiated the conversation. It was Jesus that gave the command. Learn this truth. If Jesus calls you out, there will always be something or someone that will try to hold you back from answering that call of Jesus Christ. I'll guarantee you. When I was 23, when I was 23, I gave my heart to Jesus. And Sherry will tell you that our lives radically changed. I knew that night that Jesus said to Tom Moore, follow me. I had a new house. I had two kids. We were kids, <laughs> me and her. I had a good job. And 
I found every excuse in the world to tell Jesus, not today. And for almost 20 years, I lived with no peace in my life. There is always going to be something that will try to hold you back from the call of Jesus Christ in your life. It may be, it may be your home. It may be your marriage. It may be your kids. It may be your job. It may be a whole lot of something. But there's always going to be something. You know why? You know why me and her didn't answer that call? Because it was the fear of the unknown. That's what it was. It was the fear of that I could not trust God enough to do what he said, so it was un an unknown, and it scared us. And death, as much as we like to talk about it, as much as we believe it, what the gospel says, death is pretty much a one-time experience, and it's an unknown. I found that death in a family does one of two things. It either brings out the best in that family or it brings out the worst in that family and there's not a whole lot in between. I don't believe that Jesus was being callous to this man over the death of a loved one. Death was our doing, not his doing. You see the Genesis account of that. And he reminds us that death will happen and only he holds the cure to it. And even in the agony of death, the gospel of Jesus Christ needs preached. So in a classroom in Union College in Barberville, Kentucky, a great man of God named Ellsworth Callis told a group of wannabe preachers who were mostly second career, didn't have the right statistics and the qualifications. And he said this profound statement that I will never forget. He said, you guys need to know that what you say at a funeral service will be remembered more than any Sunday sermon you'll ever preach. Boy, were those true, prophetic, wise words. Be careful what you say to someone who is in the agony of death. It is not a time for canned little cheap sayings. It is not a time to beat them over the head with your Bible. It is a time to be the extension of Jesus Christ in their life that they desperately need. Despite the tragedies of life, our primary purpose is to preach or to tell others about the kingdom of God. That's our primary purpose. Lastly, this morning... I call this the true test. Of all the things in these three verses that Jesus asked of these three men, I have found this last one to be the hardest of all. I want you to picture in your mind a mental picture of what Jesus paints of a farmer and a plow. Some of you have done that. So you'll be very uh, familiar with this picture. If you're not a farmer and you've never run a tractor with a plow or anything like that, use another analogy. 
if I know some of you have uh, canoe, uh, kayaks and canoes, if you don't have a focal point to get where you're going and keep a track of that focal point, you will go off course. If you're lost and really lost, I don't mean like, I mean if you're really, really lost somewhere and you don't keep a focal point, if you are right-handed, you will eventually walk in a circle to the right and you will come back to the exact same place that you were when you found out you were lost. And if you're left-handed, you'll work, you'll walk to the left and come. Those of you that have ever trained bagels and hunted with bagels, how does it work? When you jump a rabbit, the dog gets on it, and that rabbit is so busy looking back at that dog that he doesn't keep a focal point on where he's going and doesn't hold up and you stand there exactly where the stupid rabbit got jumped in the first place and the first thing you know the barking gets farther away and then it starts to get closer and closer and before you know it here comes this bunny back to the exact same spot where you jumped it in the first place well Jesus tells the church if we take our eyes off of God this is hard hard language we are not fit for his kingdom we're in a pandemic you all know that But if you haven't figured it out, we're in a pandemic of distraction. Somebody will at least nod their head up and down or something. There is more distraction than I have ever seen in my life. The devil is using everything he can to get the church's eyes off of God. And if he can do that, the gospel will not be preached. Souls won't be, sa won't be saved. And eternity will be affected. A fan club church is a church that has taken her eyes off of Jesus Christ. Just in conclusion this morning. I hope everybody takes this right. The days of old school preachers like me are fading fast. More and more churches want to be fan clubs than evangelical presences in this world. Now, that shouldn't surprise me because Jesus said it would happen. But I got to tell you, it grieves my soul. I believe we're in a crossroads in America. I don't know if you believe that or not, but I believe we're in a crossroads. And our future is going to be determined by the choices we make at that crossroads. Jesus sets the standard, but he leaves the choices up to us. Whoever gets elected in November is not going to save this country. There is only one being that's going to bring America through the crossroads, and that is Jesus Christ. The choice is going to be, will the church be a fan club, or will the church know Jesus? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray I've been true to your word this morning. 
And though it sounds good to be a fan of Jesus, I just don't want to be just a fan. I want to know him. I pray today that everybody listening today, by whatever means they're listening, that the Holy Spirit has talked to them, even now, softly but harshly, and told them, quit being a fan and know me. And this morning, if there's anybody here or anybody listening that knows all about Jesus but doesn't know Jesus, I pray today that you would fall to your knees, ask the God of heaven to forgive your sins and repent of who you are and get to know Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. And so, Father, I just ask you for your grace today. I thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you for these beautiful people. And I pray with all my heart that this church called Mount Olive is never a member of the Jesus fan club. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's been a good day to be in church, huh? Those are harsh words, I know. But it's been a good day to be in church. So, go in peace. Go in joy. Go in love. May the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent, one from the other. May God's blessing surround you today as you and walk in his way. May his presence within guard and keep you from sin. Go in peace, go in joy, go in 